Okay, so, like Avram was saying, I think a lot of people throughout, throughout their lives, throughout their careers, they're solicited, and some people, they give their advice without being solicited for marriage advice. And one of my things that I used to do when I was a child was there's these Encyclopedia Brown books. I'm sure you're familiar with these books. I don't know if they have them in Russian, but it's a big, it was a big thing when I was a kid. And these books, you read a story, and you're reading a story about children who are playing or fighting or stealing or whatever the case is, and there's a mystery. And at the end, you're supposed to try to solve the mystery. You hear a story, and you're supposed to say, who's at fault? Who did something right? Who did something wrong? Who stole something? And very often, in marriage, we ask questions and we say, am I right, or is she right? Or are we both right? Or... Tell me that I'm right. You know, very often part of the question is you're saying, I'm right, right? <laughs> this is what she did, and, you know, this is the story. But I'll tell you a story. And let's put on, like, our Encyclopedia Brown hats and try to think if we could come up with who's right and who's wrong. And, you know, a lot of times people talk and they say, you know, I know somebody who has very good marriage. But... It's, if I tell you, you know, I know somebody who has a very good car. From the outside, a lot of times a car looks very, very good. But I'm not a mechanic. You could say, is this car a good car? Yeah, it's a good car. It looks like a good car. But a mechanic could look at it and say, you're looking at the outside of the car. It looks really nice. But if you pop the hood, there's a lot of issues underneath it. I would not buy this car. This car has a lot of problems. If you buy this car in six months from now, forget it. You're going to be in the mechanic in his shop very often. I'll tell you a story. A guy is sitting at work and every few minutes he's calling and calling and calling a big supplier of his. You have to close a deal, millions of dollars. Got a nice haircut, he's moving up in the ranks, and he knows that he needs to close this deal. It's very important to him. At the end of the day, can't get in touch with the guy and he leaves his cell phone number and he tells the guy, do me a favor. Please, whatever you do, call my cell phone. Whatever time it is, I need to speak to you. This is a very important deal that we have to close. He drives home. And as he pulls into his driveway, his cell phone rings. It's the supplier. He picks up the phone. He walks into the house. And he says to his wife, Hi. I'm on the phone. One second. And he's talking and talking. And his wife turns to him and says, kids, dinner, and he says, put everything down, I have to take care of this phone call. Okay, they finish dinner, he's still on the phone. He finishes, he's there for 45 minutes, he's on the phone, he turns off the phone, and he turns to his wife, and he says, I have 10 minutes, how is your day, you know, how's it going? And his wife gets very, very upset. And she's screaming at him, and they get into a whole argument, and she slams the door in the room, and she says, I'm never talking to you ever again. And he says, I don't understand. I don't understand something. I, come, I need to make money. I have a job. I have a responsibility. I'm an important person. Come home. Like, we, we, like where's your brains? Like, I, I don't understand. Like, where's your priorities? You need, like, when it comes to spending money, you're very supportive. When it comes to making money, I don't understand. Don't have a right. I have, I have a job. I have a responsibility. I have children. I have a family. I don't understand. What are you thinking that you could get into a bad mood over something which is so... Clearly, this is an important business opportunity that I have here. Who's right? I'll tell you another story. It's a biblical story. Maybe you heard this one. Well, who's right? I'll tell you. Oh. Hang on. The story goes that Yaakov, Avinu, Jacob... He goes to his father-in-law's house, Lavan, and he gets married, and he has four wives, two primary wives and two secondary wives, Rachel and Leah. And at the end of about 20 years of his father-in-law swindling him and him trying to get the upper hand, Hashem finally comes to Yaakov and he tells him, Yaakov, it's time for you to leave. What would happen if your wife came to you and you were in such a situation? 
living in your in-law's house with a whole bunch of children and four wives, I think you would say, thank you, God. <laughs> I'm out of here. You'd be very happy. <clears throat> so what does Yaakov do? He calls his wives into the field. And he turns to his wives and he says to them, you know, I was working for your father for so many years, and we had an agreement that I would get certain types of sheep, and your father changed the agreement, and then we made an agreement for different types of sheep, and your father changed the agreement again, and then we made another agreement, and he kept changing the agreement. A hundred times he changed the agreement. And also, last night, Hashem came to me and he said that it's time for you to leave. And he turns to his wives and he says, what, what do you think we should do? I don't understand the whole biblical story. It almost doesn't seem to make any sense whatsoever. First of all, if Hashem comes and tells you something, what do you do? You listen. And second of all, why didn't he come into the field and tell his wives, listen, Hashem said we should leave. He said we should leave, we're leaving. Start packing. He's talking to them about sheep and switching this and that, and we had an agreement. Who cares? Who cares? Why is that an important conversation that Yaakov has to have with his wives at this point? Let him just say, honey, you should know, Hashem came, it's time for us to leave. I think if it was me or you, <laughs> probably about 15 years earlier, we would have woken up one morning and said, hey, you should know, Hashem came to me last night, he said it's time for us all to leave, right? <laughs> Finally, Hashem shows up, and Hashem tells him, leave. And he, he doesn't even say that right away. He says, sheep, and there were sheep, and there was this colored sheep, and striped sheep. What are you talking so much about sheep for? Pack up the family, get on the van, and start leaving. To understand these two stories, the first story and the second story, we have to understand a very important principle. It's really, it's really three principles, which I believe are strong foundations for any marriage. If you have these three principles, I guarantee you, you'll see tremendous, as they say in Hebrew, Hatzlacha, in your marriage. But a marriage that doesn't have this is like a beautiful car, but you're not looking under the hood. This is the engine. This is the muffler. This is the key components in a marriage. If it doesn't have this, it's missing something very fundamental. When I was a kid, I was like third grade, fourth grade, so, see, my son, I have a son who's like three and a half, and he's very into money, very into money, and he knows how to count. And it's he's cute. Jewish, he, he's he Jewish, he knows how to count. <laughs> and it's funny because when, on, cool. on Purim, when, when people were giving him dollars, he was like holding it up to the light to see that it was real. And he would turn to me and say, this one is real. <clears throat> three and a half years old. When I was little, we didn't really, we didn't have money. Meaning money wasn't a big thing when I was in elementary school. So what did kids, how did you, how did you, what was the currency? The currency was business cards. True story. You go into a doctor's office, you would take like all of the business cards and put them in your pocket. Because business cards were money. You would walk around, you would say, oh, you have a bag of soda, a bag of chips, a can of soda, I'll, I'll buy it off you. How much? 25 business cards. Okay. And I would start paying you in business cards. Business cards were money. I used to come to school with a huge backpack filled with my business cards. And people guarded their business cards. It was like, it was like this was like your, your, your Brinks truck. You went out to recess, you took your business card. Your business cards were... It was, the it was money. The there was no meaning. This was, this was how it was. Business. Instead of money, we traded business cards. And people <laughs> would bet business cards, and they would say, you know, heads or tails. Well, and you say, oh, tails. Oh, no, it's heads. You owe me 10 business cards. It was money. Business cards were money. And people would walk around anyway, go into a doctor's office, an accountant's office, anybody. You just, do you have a business card? Sure. And the guy would take out, I'll take all of them. And you would just take business cards. That's how it was. Business cards were money. Imagine if every business card in my backpack had your name on it. Okay? So you open up your backpack and you look inside and it says on it, Accountant, with your name. It says in it, lawyer, with your name. Plumber, electrician, contractor, barber, psychologist. 
all these different business cards, they all have your name on it. They have a lot of jobs. Be very busy. Imagine it's right before Pesach. The busiest day of the year, Arab Pesach. And there's a major flood in your house. And all of your cousins are there. And the fifth cousins. And everybody you know, they're all in the house. It's packed. People are sleeping in the attic, in the basement. And all of a sudden, everybody starts screaming. And you go, what's the matter? And they say, there's a huge flood in the basement. The toilets are overflowing. The showers are overflowing. There's water coming from the top floor down to the basement. And everybody's screaming. And everybody's yelling. And you pick up the phone... And you make a call, and a guy comes down, and he says, yes. And you say, are you a plumber? And he says, yes. You say, well, look at my house. It's 20 minutes before Pesach. And he looks at him, and he says, oh, one second. And he pulls out a card, and it says on it, electrician. He says, I am also an electrician. You say to the guy, you're an electrician. I don't need an electrician. I need a plumber. And he says, wait one second. I'm a psychologist. A psychologist. I don't need a psychologist. I need a plumber. I need a plumber who knows how to do his job. And he says, wait a second, I have a lot of business cards. And he's pulling out business cards and business cards and business cards. He says, you are out of your mind. You have a lot of business cards here. And some of them are seemingly more important than others. But right now I need one business card. The one that says... Plumber. That's the only one I need. I don't care about all these other business cards because they might be important in the right time and in the right place. But what I need is a plumber. Every one of us has business cards. When you're born, you're born into this world with a business card. In fact, in the hospital, they even have that little card that they put on and it says, Epstein baby, right? You know, Ibramov baby, it says... The baby, boy, it says the weight. That's the card. But then as you go through life, people hand you more cards. Those cards are not physical cards, but they're real cards. You go into kindergarten, you go into pre one eight. people hand you cards. You now has your name, and it says first grade, second grade, third grade, accountant, doctor, lawyer. As you go through life, you accumulate more and more business cards so that when you're doing things in life, Essentially, what you're doing is you're playing a card. You're saying, this is who I am. I'm an accountant. People come to my office, and I say, I am an accountant. I might also be a psychologist. I'm not. But I might also be a psychologist and say, oh, tell me all your life's problems. They're not in my office for that. They're here for a specific reason, because they need their tax return done. They have a tax question. They have a financial question. Everyone has business cards. And every business card has two sides. The front is what it has on the card. tells you who you are. <clears throat> the back of the business card tells you what you do. What is my job in first grade? What is my job in second grade? My job in first grade and my job in second grade are going to be two different jobs. In first grade, I have to know what I need to know for the first grade. And in second grade, I have to know what I need to know for the second grade. You ever hear sometimes people talk about their kids and they say, he was so smart and that's why he always got kicked out of class? Like the kid was so advanced that when the rabbi was talking, he was so brilliant that the rabbi kicked him out of class. That's great, wonderful. He's such a brilliant kid. But he's not playing the right card in the right classroom. He might be playing a third grade card in a first grade classroom. It's not going to work well. You have to play the right card at the right time. And every card is very specific. You can't be playing with blocks in the fifth grade. You're playing the wrong card. And you can't be doing algebra when you're in nursery. Every card has its place and every person has the right card in the right place. Then they'll be successful. Yaakov Avinu, he shows us the right card for marriage. He shows us what a marriage looks like. He shows us the, the fundamental, like the essence of what a marriage is supposed to be. You see, every card, some cards you're handed. You go through life, 
And you're handed a card. You're in first grade, you're in second grade, you're in third grade. You got to do it. Nothing to do. You become a, a, a bar mitzvah, 13. They say, this is what you have to do. Right? You take a job as, a, as, as whatever it is. <coughs> they tell you, this is what you have to do. But certain, certain things you select. You became a barber. Nobody forced you to be a barber. Right? Nobody said, this is what you have to do. You said, this is what I want to do. You go into a, a shop and you say, I would like to work here. Take the business card, put my name on your business card. You're asking, you're begging, please, I would like to sign up to something. If after two days working somewhere, you look at them and you say, cutting here, it's so greasy, this is not for me. They'll say, fine, so leave. Certain, certain things you have to do in life and certain things you don't have to do. You decide, I want to take this plunge, I want to take this step. Marriage is a step that we take voluntarily. You can't be forced into marriage. It's Jewish law. Nobody could force you. You have to look at the person. You have to like the person. You have to date the person. You say, I like you. I select you. Will you marry me? And they say, okay. Nobody's being forced. No, he is. Back home, he is. Even back home, it wasn't a forced marriage. It can't be forced. According to Jewish law, it has to be that there's a consent on both sides. And they may have been young, yeah, yeah. they may have been guided. Law, no, but according to Harry law, yes. No, okay. but still, I feel like every girl and a guy had a choice. If they didn't want to get married, they would, they would not be married secretly that I don't want to marry him. And if the parents do want to listen to their kids, they will take their advice. If they don't... Exactly. They you can't. Them. According to the Talmud, you have to, you have to come into this willingly. I agree to this. I like her. Or even if I don't like her, I'll get to like her. I'll get to know her. I don't know anything about her. I'll figure it out. But there's an agreement. Nobody could force you into this agreement. Now, you come into this marriage and you get a business card. And the business card says on it, husband. It says on it, wife. And the question is, what is on the back of that business card? What does it say? What's the, what's the goal? What's the job behind that business card? If I'm a barber, so I have to know a lot about being a barber. I have to know about cutting hair, washing hair, right? Shaving the back. What does it mean when they say a fade? What's a three? What's a... They, there's a lot of things I have to know about being a barber. And what do I have to do? What do I have to know when I'm getting married? What's my job? What's the essence of my job? What do I have to do? So the Ramban, Nachmanides, he says, I'll tell you what your job is. It's based on the Torah where the Torah says, that a man's job is to be davak ve'ishtoi. What's the Hebrew word davak? Devak. What does devak mean? Glue. It's glue. To cling, to stick. Says the Ramban, you know what that means? That means, shetekasher daita bedaitoi ve'kavanasa ve'kavanascha. What does that mean? Kesher. Kesher means to connect. One person and another person. Says the Ramban, it's talking about their minds, their mindset. Two people whose mindsets become one. That is marriage. Everything else is not marriage. Everything else is a roommate, is a coexisting friend, is a coexisting marriage, is a coexisting relationship. But the essence of what a Jewish marriage is supposed to be is summed up by one word, kesher. And kesher means just as you worry about yourself and you feel for yourself and you care for yourself and you know what you need intuitively. You say, I need food, I need this, I need respect, I need attention, I need affection, I need appreciation. All these things that you need, great, wonderful. Because now there's somebody else in your life. <coughs> and you can now turn to that person and you can give them the things that they need. So Yaakov Avinu, he says like this. If I bring my wives into the field and I say to them, we have to leave, we have to go, Hashem came and spoke to me, what are they going to say? Okay, we have to leave. But is there any kesher in there? Is there any solidification of their relationship? No. The connection is not there. Yaakov calls his wives into the field and he says to them, the fact that we have to go is true. But before we go, I have to get on the same page as you. Let me sit here and talk to you. Let me explain to you why I feel that we should leave. Let me explain to you why I feel that it's time for us to leave your father's house. It's time for us to take a journey, to face life's uncertainties. The reason is because it was very difficult for me here. And he starts laying out his plan for why he thinks they have to leave and where he thinks they're going to go from here. 
And what did the women say? They say, we agree with your plan. And also, Hashem told us to leave. Let's leave. The fact that they have to leave, everybody understands they have to leave. But to get onto the same page, to create that connection, that bond, that, Yaakov says, is even more important, in a certain sense, than the fact that we actually have to go. How she believes in me, as long as she was talking. It was a different world. It was a different world back then. They had Avraham, they had Yitzchak. Yaakov was the third in line. They knew he wasn't joking around. It was a very different world. It's very hard for us to put our forefathers in context. If me and you came home and said, you know, God told me this. Who came after Yaakov? Yosef, Yosef. Yosef was one of the twelve. Yeah. So it was a different world then. But they trusted him. They knew that he was telling the truth. Rabbi? Yeah. Isn't it taking a risk of, in order to try and making this kosher, the connection, before leaving? If I would think, okay, if I was in this situation in the story, I would think, okay, I, I do need to make this kosher, the connection with my wife, and speak to her about it, explain to her why we need to need, leave so that both of us are on the same page. But what if she doesn't want to? Regardless of why I think we should, she says, no, I want to stay here. It's, it's she's, she's not... She's not connecting basically so, so isn't you, it it's taking a risk basically I'll tell you another another biblical story look at the story that happened with Lot and his wife they were not on the same page how fast did that marriage end very quickly who's Lot again the Lot story. was Avram's nephew in Sodom <coughs> no. the angels show up to Sodom and they say it's time for you to leave Sodom and Lot is running and running and the Torah even says Vayis Mama and he was delaying he was here, he was there. He doesn't talk to his wife at all. And the angels turn to him and they say, we just have one rule. When you run, make sure you're running away. You're not looking back when everyone gets destroyed. And Lot says, okay. And he runs and his wife, she turns around. They weren't on the same page. The marriage is over pretty quickly. Yaakov understood something. You could listen to direction, but you're going to just be driving right into a wall. Life has so many challenges, so many challenges. Having children is a challenge. Not having children is a challenge. Having a business is a challenge. Not having a business is a challenge. There are so many challenges in your life. Yaakov said, the fact that I have to take another step forward is all great and wonderful. But if I'm taking a step forward and that's a step away from my spouse, then that's very dangerous. That's very dangerous for everybody. What happens when we get faced with something? Where, who am I going to turn to? It's going to be me against her, against this challenge. Hashem's going to be telling me to go in one direction and she's not even holding where I am right now. So Yaakov says, before anything, I have to get her onto the same page. And your question is, what happens if the woman would have said, we're not interested in going? Then guess what? Maybe Yaakov would have said, I have to solidify my marriage a little bit more. What does Ma that mean, solidify? Maybe he would have said, I have to... What did he do? Let's understand, what did Yaakov do? What was the practical thing that Yaakov did to his wives? He turned to his wives and he essentially said to them, I care about you. I care about your feelings. I care about what you're thinking. I care about, I care about what you're feeling. I care about your emotions. We all live in four worlds. We live in the spiritual world, the mental world, the physical world, and the emotional world. Those are the four areas that we exist in. <coughs> and a marriage, a solid marriage, is where you turn to your spouse and without even saying it, you show them that I care about all of these worlds. When a husband comes home and a wife has food waiting for him, what she's saying is, I care about your physical world. I care that you should have food on the table. And I respect you enough that I'm going to put the food out. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to make it. I'm not going to just call you up and say, just go pick it up from the store somewhere. That's a, a, a woman saying, I care about you. And that builds, that's cash. That's a relationship. She could simply say, go take care of it yourself. A marriage is about two people saying, I'm going to care about you and I'm going to give you unconditionally whatever you need. So that's exactly what Yaakov does to his wife. He turns to them and he says to them, I care about you. I feel you. Because if I didn't care about you, I would just say, let's leave. I would just say, pack up the car and let's drive. And I'll explain it on the way. But he doesn't do that. He stops before. And he has a conversation. And the conversation is, what do you think about this? What are your thoughts? What are your feelings? Tell me what your thoughts are. He doesn't say we're leaving. He says, let me understand what your feelings are over here. And once the women say, the wives say, we're ready to go. Yaakov says, great. Now I know that whatever I'm going to face in the future, it's me and you together. We're going through this together. We could deal with this together. You know, sometimes let's say you have a, a child in school who's having a hard time. 
So the rabbi says, he calls up the parents and he says, you should come down and you should talk, you know, we have to have a meeting about your son. So what happens very often is that the parents come down, the father's screaming like a lunatic, the mother's sitting there and she's dead embarrassed and she's kicking her husband under the table, don't talk so much, and he says, this is my son, and blah, 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 and he's screaming and screaming and screaming. You can see there's no pressure. They, it's not the two of them united with what their position is. It's, it's a man who has his position, and it's a woman who has her position. And on the outside, they might look very happy, but when, it, when they're confronted with things, you see that there's no pressure here. Yaakov says, we're going to deal with things. Let's get onto the same page. Let's get first on the same page that we're leaving. And then we'll get onto the same page as everything else in our lives. That is a marriage. Kesher is marriage. That's what the Torah says. The Torah gives one directive for marriage. You would think the Torah would write books and books all about marriage. It doesn't. It has one sentence about marriage. It's the whole, it's the whole guidance is one sentence. Vidavak the ishtay. It's the whole thing. Kesher. Without Kesher, it's no marriage. Because you know why? Sometimes you read a book and you say to yourself, Maybe I do something from this chapter. Maybe I do something from that chapter. I don't do everything. Okay. Here the Torah is saying, there's one thing to do. You either do it or you don't do it. You can't pull out and say, I do a little of this, a little of that. No. It's one thing. You either do it or you don't do it. It's a very simple directive. V'davak ishtai. What does the Ramban say? Kesha. Kesha, get on the same page. Not just on the same page theoretically, physically, emotionally. Everything. I feel you. I sense you. I know you. I know exactly what you need. And I'm willing to give it to you without expecting anything in return. And that is the business card of a husband. And that is the business card of a wife. That's what a marriage business card looks like. And Yaakov Avinu says, this is what a marriage is supposed to look like. I have to do a million things. But this, is, this, one, comes, this one comes first. I think the second thing that Yaakov does is like an underlying component to every marriage. Without this, it can't happen. He takes his wives into the field. Why? Why didn't he just sit down by the dinner table and say, this is the deal. What does everybody think about this? Tell me, what do you think? Do you think we should leave? We shouldn't leave. We're taking a poll. Or talk to them at home. Talk to them in the room. Talk to them in the attic. So the Talmud says, that a field is a place of privacy. You want privacy? Go into a field. Nobody's around. Nobody's listening through the walls. A field is a place of privacy. Yaakov takes his wives into the field to show them that they are important. You could very often you have a conversation with your spouse. You send them a text, right? Some people, everybody here, part of like a WhatsApp group. You know, sometimes you're on a WhatsApp group, there's like 80,000 people on the WhatsApp group and your phone is hijacked. <laughs> and very often, you see a couple that they're talking to each other on the WhatsApp group, like a private conversation. Hey, what time are you coming home? Or 8.30. It's like a WhatsApp group. There's, there's 50 people listening in and they're having a conversation. Yaakov says, that's not showing your wife that you're important. Important means it's me and you. It means I put away my phone. It means I sit there and I talk to just you. It's not a family conversation. It's me and you. We, we decide what's going on. You have a kid who's having trouble in school. You don't sit down by the dinner table with all the rest of the children and say, Shlemy's having a hard time in, in, in yeshiva. What does everybody think about it? Oh, Shlemy's an idiot. Oh, Shlemy's so stupid. Oh, yeah, what do you think? Oh, Shlemy stole your toy last week. Okay, good. What else? It's not, that's not a conversation. The conversation is you bring your wife into a private place. You go out for a drink. You go to 7-Eleven, you go for a walk on the boardwalk, and you turn to her and you say to her, what do you think we should do about Shlemy? It's a private conversation. It shows her that it's me and you, and there's nobody else here. I don't have my phone, I'm not answering my phone, I'm not in the middle of a business call, I'm not in the middle of anything. This is important. You are important. And therefore, it's just me and you. You know, some great rabbis, when I, when I used to visit some of my rabbis in their house, you would see that they would eat dinner very, very late at night. Some of them, 11, 12 o'clock at night, they would come home after a very, very long day. And when they would come in, the wives would come running over, and they would sit there and they would have dinner for them. And sometimes I would come, let's say, 12 o'clock at night, and I would see that the husband was sitting there, the rabbi was sitting there, he's finishing eating dinner, and his wife is <coughs> sitting right next to him. Right next to him. She ate five hours ago, but she's sitting right next to him. It's private time between me and you. It's not just, here's the food, goodbye. 
it's you're an important person. I want to spend time with you. I want to get onto the same page as you. I want to sit there. That's what Yaakov does. He says, if you're an important person, I'm going to take you out into the field. And it's going to be a personal conversation between me and you. So there's kasher and there's importance. You show the person that you are important. I have nothing else that's going on. I have a question. Yes. Since he had four wives, he did that individually with all four wives or all four at the same he time? He took out only Rachel and Leah. And not the other two? Not the other two, because the other two originally were like the maidservants mm-hmm. of Rachel and Leah. So he took out these two, these were the primary wives, mm-hmm. and he didn't do it individually. Why he didn't do that, I don't know. But he took out the two that he felt were the ones who had to be made the conversation, and that was Maybe how he did it. they were sisters. Maybe. They were together. They were together, yes. So that was, that was his, his mindset going in. Kashar? And how do I do it? I'm showing you that you're an important person. Your opinion is important. I value what you say. If somebody asked before, what would happen if the woman would say, we're not interested in going? This wasn't a charade. It wasn't a show. Hey, what do you think? And they would say, oh, oh, this is a terrible idea. And he would say, okay, well, too bad. We're going anyways. It wasn't a joke. It was a real thing. He was taking their, their, their minds into consideration. Now, sure, he was, he was able to, to present his case, and he did. He said, this is what I think. What do you think? I'm presenting my side. Now, what do you think about this? That was his conversation, but it was a real conversation. But the third thing that he does, knocks it out of the park. If you think about it, it, makes, it almost sounds like every two seconds, I have to call my wife. Hey, honey, what do you think? Should I make a right or should I take off? Some women think <laughs> that their husbands need to do this. You know, Like they're driving down the street. Oh, make a right. Turn. Go, go the other way. You know, like They're giving directions every five seconds. But you think, okay, I guess they're getting onto the same page. It usually doesn't work that way. What, is, what about Yaakov? Yaakov, if you look in the Torah, never, ever has a conversation with his wives ever again. Never. Doesn't ever talk to them. Now, it sounds like, okay, big deal. So he was an older man, and he didn't have to talk so much. He just, you know, just sat at home. He didn't have to talk so much. Look at what happened in his life. He had to deal with the fact that Yosef was sold down to Egypt. He had to deal with the fact that he decided to transplant his, his whole family from Canaan down to Egypt. That was a major conversation. He, he takes his family out of Lovin's house, and right away, Esav, his brother, attacks him with 400 men. And Yaakov says, I have a brilliant plan. We'll split up the family into two. Half of us will run, and half of us will fight. Okay, he had 12 sons, right? How old was the... He had 11 sons at the time. How old was the oldest? Ruvain? According to many commentaries, he was 12 years old. So you have a 12-year-old boy and an older man who are going to fight 400 giants. We're going to just, just destroy them. You don't think this is a conversation to have with your wife? Honey, you have a brilliant idea. <laughs> Watch this one. His wife would say, oh, are you crazy? But that's not what happens. He doesn't have any conversation with his wives. You know why? I'll tell you why. Because his wives, his wives knew that when there's a major thing that's happening, my husband has my back. My husband knows what I'm thinking about. My husband, he, he knows about me. He knows what I would be saying in such a situation. This concept is fundamental to every single marriage. It's a concept called pas basale. Pas basale means bread in the basket. It's as if you have it already. I don't have it, but it's as if I have it already. I'll give you an example. On Yom Kippur, we fast. In the days of the temple, when they used to fast, they had this thing where they would call it the Sayer La'azazel. They would take a goat, they would walk it out into the desert, and when they would be out in the desert, somebody would take this goat and they would throw it off a mountain. How long did this person walk in the desert? It was a very far walk, a number of miles. It took them a long time to get there. And every, every time he would walk, there was a little hut. And in this hut, there was a man sitting there with bread and food and water. It was the middle of the desert. And sometimes in Israel, on Yom Kippur, it gets very, very hot. And he would say to this guy, you're walking in the desert. Would you like a drink? Would you like some food? Now, I don't know about you. I'm not the greatest faster. I think if I was the guy who was, be, who was walking a goat for miles and miles in the desert, maybe I would say yeah. And don't forget, this wasn't like he was violating anything. He was allowed to eat. He was allowed to drink. He was, a, he was the exception. He was allowed to take a drink because he was thirsty. He was on a mission. right? We're sitting here for a half hour on a day that we're allowed to eat and everybody's drinking. 
Imagine you're walking in the desert on a fast day. Sure, okay, I could have a cup of water. I'll take a cup of water. How many times in all the history of the, of the Beis HaMikdash do you think anybody ever took a drink? The answer is never. Never. Over 8,000 times people were offered drinks in the desert and they never took a drink. Never. And the Gemara says, the Talmud says, why didn't they ever take a drink? What, there was a miracle that they weren't hungry? And you know what the Talmud says? They had something called pas pasale. You know, sometimes it's like it comes Yom Kippur, and, and you're supposed to say, I accept upon myself Yom Kippur. Right? You ever have this? You say, I accept upon myself Yom Kippur, and all of a sudden, two seconds later, you're like, I feel like I'm going to die. Like, how am I going to make it? 25 hours. I'm, I feel like I'm expiring. Kikol hatsala. You look, like you're ready dying. It, you just accepted the fast three minutes ago and you just ate a meal that's like, you know, fit for 12 people. <laughs> How are you going to make it? Because you, once you say, I, I, I'm fasting, all of a sudden you, you're finished. Over here you have a person, he doesn't feel like he's fasting. He's going through the day and they tell him, you could eat, you could drink. He says, oh, I could eat and I could drink? Eh, who needs it? I'm doing okay. Very often somebody comes to your house, you say, hey, you want to drink? What do they say? No, I'm doing okay. That was this guy. I'm doing okay. Why? Because I know that if I really need it, I could take the drink. So therefore, I don't need the drink. But if I know that I can't drink it, ah, oh, we're dying. Right away, I need it's something to drink. It's all about the fundamental. No? It's all about the head. It's all about the brain. No? It, exactly. It's all psychological. And marriage is all psychological. What Yaakov says is as follows. He says, I know that my wives need my attention, my affection, my appreciation. They need me to be there thinking about them consciously. But if they know that I really take this seriously, and that I'm always doing this to them, that I'm, I'm thinking about them, what would you be saying in such a case? For example, you have a child who's having a hard time in school. When you walk into that school building, if a husband is sitting there and he's yelling and he's screaming at the principal, and the wife is sitting there and she's looking at her husband and she's nodding her head, and she's saying, yeah, this is what I would have said also. I'm very upset. You're not treating my son the right way. That's kasher. They don't have to have a conversation before they walk into the principal because they are on the same page. I'm not saying you should yell at principals. What I'm saying is that when you get into a situation, when you see that the couple is on the same page, that's paspasale. That's a feeling of, I know that the two of us are on the same page. We don't have to have the conversation because this is what I would have said anyways. Yaakov Avinu says as follows. He takes his wives into consideration and then he says, I don't have to have this conversation with you ever again because you know that whatever you would say, I'm already thinking it. It's such a high level to get to. It's not a simple thing that what, what he did. But on our everyday lives, when you show your spouse, I care about you, I really do. I'm always thinking about you. You came home, look, I had food waiting for you. You know, I, I know you're in a bad mood today, I gave you a little bit of space. Whatever it is that you feel that your spouse needs, Without them asking for it, without them begging for it, just I intuitively feel you, that's kasher. And then you don't have to do that every five seconds. You don't have to have that conversation every five seconds. Why does a woman have the need to tell her husband every two seconds, turn left, turn right, he doesn't know how to drive? How does he get wherever he's going when you're not in the car? What she's saying is, I don't feel like you're caring about me. I don't feel that you, you know what I'm feeling inside. So I'll tell you, I'll nag you to death. Until you finally realize <laughs> that I'm in the car also and that I have feelings. Let's go back to our original story. You have a guy who comes home and he's on the phone. And he's on the phone and he's turning to his wife and he says to her, look, I'm on the phone. It's very important. What he's saying is I have a million business cards and one of those business cards is a job. But you're another business card. Now which card comes first? You or my job? And you know what he tells his wife? This comes first. And his wife reminds him, no, even, we are not holding there yet. Even though it's just once that happened, that, that's the that's feeling the that symptom. the wife gets? That's the symptom. He could have played it a little different. He could have called her on the way home and said, you should know I'm expecting a very important phone call. I really miss you. I really care about you. I can't wait to spend time with you. It might take a little bit of time if I get this phone call. He could have told this guy, hang on one second, I'm going to text my wife. There's ways that he could connect with his wife. 
But if his wife is getting into a bad mood, what she is expressing is a lack of kesha. A lack of, you don't feel me. You don't feel me. Okay, I'm going to make you feel me. I'm going to make you remember me. I'm going to make you remember that you didn't make me number one. That is what happens in every situation when somebody gets into a bad mood. When somebody's yelling at somebody else. When somebody's telling somebody, talk, don't talk. Get in, they get upset. They're yelling, they're screaming. They're saying, where's the kesha? Where's the kesha? I don't feel it. You're playing business cards. You're playing the wrong cards. Rav Yashiv, he said that when a husband and a wife spend time together, it's like a yuntif. It's like a holiday. Mm -hmm. It's like a Pesach. Right before Pesach. When things are going crazy. <clears throat> and the house is flooding. What happens then? You need, to, you need a plumber who's going to play the right card. When a wife is waiting at home for her husband, she's saying, it's Pesach. I set up food. I have the kids. This is Yantif. This is a time. This is a Chag, yeah? This is a time for us to sit down and spend time as a family. This is your business card. Your time to play the right card. What's that right card? A husband with Kesher. Making you important. Pas Pesale. And when he walks in the door and he says, I have other business cards. It's like the guy who shows up and he's sitting there and you say, I have a flood and he's pulling out, I'm an electrician, <laughs> I'm a psychologist, I'm a barber. He said, my friend, you're out of your mind. I don't need any of those things. I need one card, I need a plumber. And you come home, your wife says, I need one card. I need the card that says I need husband. It's the only thing I need. When you give that to me, I'm, I'm happy, I'm fine. And when you give it to me enough and I really know that you mean it, when you come home and you don't do it, I could forgive you very easily. It's not a problem. But when you're always forgetting this, when everything else is important, and it is important to make money, and it is important to spend time with the children, and it is important to do all the millions of things that we have to do. But guess what? It was important for Yaakov Avinu to leave. Hashem told him to leave. It was important for him to leave. But he said there's one thing that comes before that. Another business card. The business card of marriage. That trumps all other business cards. That, I believe, are three fundamental things that when you put them together, you have a good marriage. You pop the, you pop the hood of a car, it's beautiful. It purrs. That's what they say, right? It purrs. A car purrs. It, it, it runs well. But when you don't have that, the car can look very, very nice on the outside. But underneath, there's bickering and there's fighting and there's people vying for attention and there's wives slamming doors and saying, I hate you and never talking to you again. And his husband's walking out. His hu Everybody's getting upset at each other. There's no reason for it. It's so simple. Kesher is marriage. No kesher is no marriage. That's it. Okay, question here.